subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello everyone welcome to rao's ias dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 10th may 2022 like always, we shall pick up articles important for civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam. There is an article on page number 10, how the PM and CGI agree on outdated laws. The article makes comparison of the comments of the Prime Minister recently and the Chief Justice of India in June last year concerning the sedition law. Prime Minister Modi has talked about doing away with the colonial baggage. And CGI has already observed that the sedition law was a colonial baggage used by British against Mahatma Gandhi and Bal Ganga Dhartilak. What we will do here is to have a general discussion on doing away with laws that has outlived its time and purpose. So it's going to be a general discussion. The more specific discussion on sedition has been done already in the DNS and I'll provide the link for the same. First of all, for the purpose of mains examination, you must be handy with some of the rulings, judgments of Supreme Court that has resulted in considerable reform of laws. Beginning with the case that is the context of the article, Shreya Single case. In Shreya Single versus Union of India, Supreme Court declared Section 66A of the IT Act 2000 as unconstitutional because this section made online posting of information considered as grossly offensive, a criminal punishable act. Supreme Court declared this as being violative of Article 19 1A of the Constitution and it is not covered under the reasonable restrictions defined in Article 19 2. There was one another aspect that Supreme Court highlighted that this section has a very general expression. It is open-ended, undefined and therefore arbitrary. Supreme Court via various judgment has removed arbitrariness in legislation and the executive process. Law must not be arbitrary. This is a laid down principle in the legal jurisprudence. Way back in 1980s, in 1983 actually, in Mithu versus State of Punjab case, Supreme Court struck down section 303. Section 303 actually provided for capital punishment for a murder by a person serving a life term in another case. Meaning a person serving life term in another case somehow gets to murder another person, automatically he will be given capital punishment. This was a struck down by the Supreme Court as being violative of Article 21 and 14. The reason was not that this capital punishment was being too harsh for a person already serving life term in another case and after that he has murdered a person. The reason for striking it down was that the only punishment mentioned was capital punishment and it did not give judiciary the power to exercise its discretion. Then recently in 2018, in Navtej Singh Johar versus Union of India, Supreme Court struck down section 377 of the IPC. This section criminalized unnatural sex. Supreme Court declared section 377 as unconstitutional. Unnatural sex here implies any sex apart from sex between opposite gender. In Joseph Schein case, Supreme Court held that adultery as defined in section 497 of the IPC is arbitrary, discriminatory, violative of dignity of women and therefore unconstitutional. Supreme Court held that wife is not the property of husband. Husband is not the master of wife. So adultery in this case was defined as adultery without the permission of the husband. That permission of the husband was the problematic thing in this section. Previously, Supreme Court has prescribed some measure so that section 498A is not misused. The section is related with dowry. There are women's rights, but there are also men's rights, and men should not be unnecessarily harassed using this provision of dowry. You must have some examples ready at the tip of your finger so that off the cuff, you can write certain points as to how Supreme Court has reformed the law of the land. Then you must be able to understand and appreciate why these reformation is necessary. First of all, it helps in progressive realization of rights. Progressive realization of right is a doctrine in legal jurisprudence where progressively as the society progresses, as the time lapses, more and more rights must be conferred on citizens as and when the state is ready to provide. 
Otherwise, this expectation of progressive realization of right is too unrealistic from executive and legislatures. For example, Supreme Court in case Puttaswami case declared right to privacy as a fundamental right. As we have just talked about in the Tej Singh Johar case, when Section 377 was struck down, Supreme Court made an observation that an individual's right to develop one's individuality against the demand of social conformity must be recognized. Individual rights, liberties, freedom, these have to be protected and progressively so with time. Supreme Court in Shabri Mala judgment has declared that individual freedom prevails over group rights, even in the matter of religion. Similar observation has been made in the Joseph Schein case. Justice Chan Shud made the observation that Section 497 subordinates women and creates a dent on individual identity of women. When laws become old, they have to be reformed as per the prevailing morality. This helps in progressive realization of rights. For this, laws need to be reformed and courts help in reforming the laws. In MC Mehta case, Supreme Court declared that right to live in a pollution-free environment is at par with right to life. So right to live in pollution-free environment is part of Article 21. These reformation of laws helps in setting a higher bar, a higher standard for rights of citizens. Supreme Court in Dong Liam Kham versus Union of India stated, that the principle of non-refoulement is part of guarantee under Article 21, irrespective of nationality. Principle of non-refoulement means if a person under threat from his own state has come to seek refuge in your state, you cannot return him back unless the situation normalizes in his home state. As we have already talked about, liberty and freedom of citizens are protected by courts when they reform the laws. The one in the context Shreya single case. Supreme Court struck down Section 66A of the IT Act. Supreme Court previously in Ranga Rajan versus P. Jagjeevan Ram case has said that mere threat to public order cannot be the ground to suppress freedom of expression. Supreme Court in Kedarnath versus the State of Bihar has said that sedition charges can be imposed only if it involves intention to create disorder or incitement to violence. Mere criticism of the government should not call for sedition charges. Comments against government, however strongly worded, if does not involve violence, are not sedition. Supreme Court observed this in Common Cause versus Union of India case in 2016. Liberty, freedom, choices. Supreme Court has enabled that, enforced that, protected that for citizens of India. In the Aadhaar verdict, Supreme Court has declared that Aadhaar cannot be made mandatory. But the Aadhaar project was not considered unconstitutional on the ground that it does not create a surveillance state. It does not impinge into the liberty, privacy of citizens. But Supreme Court did modify the Aadhaar Act that was passed by the Parliament. Courts reforming laws is necessary because there are areas in which the executive and legislatures will not venture. In Lily Thomas' case, Supreme Court declared that MPs and MLAs convicted of a crime and awarded a minimum of two years of imprisonment loses membership of the House. In the Association for Democratic Reform and People's Union for Civil Liberty versus Union of India case, Supreme Court upheld the previously given judgment by High Court mandating that Election Commission must obtain and disclose the background information of the candidates. Similarly, Supreme Court has called for police reform in Prakash Singh case Supreme Court has done electoral reform, asking NOTA to be compulsory. Supreme Court in the NALSA case has activated the executive and legislature to protect the rights of transgenders. Courts having a check on laws like this also ensures that the political party's ideology is not imposed on citizens. The nation is governed by law. There is rule of law in the democracy. It ensures that there is complete justice. Supreme Court introduced the provision of curative petition in Ashok Hurra case and section 377 that was struck down as we have talked about was struck down through curative petition. So if it's such an important thing, it must be taken proactively by the judiciary and when judiciary does reform in legislation, there is absolute no question 
of that not getting implemented by the executive. It will call for the contempt of the court and it will break down the principle of rule of law. So police officers at all levels must be educated on the latest developments, provisions of the law that has been declared unconstitutional. Superintendent of police must have an oversight on this. Officers doing laps either by mistake or deliberately must be reported negatively in the annual confidential reports. A suggestion has come from the attorney general that there must be mention in brackets near the provision that the provision has already been struck down. Presently what happens in the law book, even in the updated ones, the sections that have been struck down are still there. But in the footnote it has been mentioned that these sections have been struck down. So maybe officers going by the rule book, they are doing it by mistake, they are not reading the footnote. And more than 1500 cases that have been registered under section 66A of the IT Act 2002 in the last five years have been by mistake. So it must be made clear in the law book that these provisions have been already struck down. Additionally, there must be check in the system itself to identify the provisions of the law under which the cases are being registered. That will obviously help in tracking the cases, the kind, the nature and also prevent cases getting registered under the provisions that have been struck down already. The author has given a very good suggestion that the unconstitutional sections of IBC must be disabled in the crime and criminal tracking network and systems. As per the directive of Supreme Court, the FIRs getting registered in the police station must get uploaded on the network within 24 to 72 hours. If the system itself can identify that the cases registered are unlawful, then such embarrassing condition like cases getting registered for years and years under sections that have been struck down will not arise. This article is from page number 8. It talks about recent experiments that have been done on W boson and muons. The experimental measured mass of W boson does not seem to be matching with the theoretical calculation from the standard model. And thus it seems that a piece of puzzle is missing and standard model is not complete. So let's have some basic discussion on particle physics concerning this issue. From the exam perspective, we have to have fundamental idea of the standard model. See, standard model is of particle physics explaining the known fundamental forces and the known fundamental particles of the universe. But here is a catch. The fundamental forces which are known in universe are electromagnetic, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force and gravitational force. But for the reason that I'll tell you very shortly, gravitational force or gravity is not considered to be a force under standard model. So the model does not recognize this as a force. So when we say that it establishes equation linking all the known forces and all known elementary particles, gravity is omitted. But physicists have had long urge to just dismantle this standard model because it has been known very well that standard model does not explain everything. For example, the gravitational force. The theory of gravitation as is described by the general relativity theory is not explained by the standard model. You already know that universe is continuously accelerating and expanding which is possibly explained by dark energy but this is not explained by standard model. Standard model also does not explain the existence of dark matter. Then there are other things, for example, the neutrino oscillation and their non-zero masses. These things are not explained by the standard model. We just have to have very rudimentary idea like this. We will not get into the detail at all. But what you have to remember on the technical point is that standard model considers three elementary particles in nature. Quarks, leptons and bosons. And you need to have general idea on these three fundamental particles. Quarks, leptons, bosons. In 2017, UPSC has asked this question. The terms event horizon, singularity, string theory and standard model are sometimes seen in news in the context of. The answer obviously is option A, observation and understanding of the universe. Event horizon, singularity, these are related with black holes. String theory gives us understanding of the universe interaction of different fundamental particles and so does the standard model. Now you must know this, if UPC has asked a rudimentary question once, they ask advanced questions on the same things later. Question on black holes have been asked again and again. So it will not be a surprise if they ask a little more advanced thing on standard model. 
According to standard model, there are three fundamental particles, quarks, leptons and bosons. Quarks forms hadrons. Hadrons are protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons, as you would know, forms the constituents of nuclei. Quarks have fractional charge. Every matter has an antimatter, so quarks have antiquarks. There are six kind of quarks and hence six kind of antiquarks. Regarding quarks, there is one thing if we have to remember, that is this. Quarks and antiquarks are the only two fundamental particles that interact through all four fundamental forces of nature. Electromagnetic force, strong and weak nuclear force, and gravitational force. As you know that protons and electrons are confined within the nucleus because that is the general nature of quark. Quark exhibits confinement. They are not observed independently, but they are always observed in combination with other quarks. Leptons are also fundamental particle, elementary particles as per the standard model, and they are also of six types, just like quarks, but they do not have fractional charge. Electron, for example, is a lepton, and you know that electrons do not have fractional charge. They have minus one unit of charge. Electrons, muons, tau. They are three kinds of leptons, and the other three are three kinds of neutrinos. So you must remember, neutrinos are also leptons. Muon is of particular interest because Muon G2 experiment is also making round in news which you must have heard and read of. We will discuss this as well very shortly. The third kind of elementary particle as per the standard model is boson. Bosons are generally thought to be particles responsible for all physical forces. But it's not just the force, it is also the mass that comes through bosons. Bosons have been named after Indian scientist Professor Satin Nath Bose. In the beginning, I have told you that standard model does not recognize gravity as force because force comes through boson and the boson corresponding to gravity has not been discovered yet. So gravity yet is not considered as a force under standard model because force comes from boson and the bosons responsible for electromagnetic force, strong, strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force exist. But we do not know of a boson that give rise to gravitational force. So it is not considered as a force. Rather, gravity is alternatively explained by the standard model, not considering it as a force. So some elementary bosons like gluons, they are force carriers. They give rise to force between particles. And there is one boson called as Higgs boson. It gives rise to the phenomena of mass. Hence, it is also termed as the God particle because the existence of universe in the, man in the manner and the way that we see and perceive because of mass, that is because of Higgs boson. And there are various other kinds of bosons as well. For example, mesons. Photon is also a boson. And there are W and Z bosons. In the last two, three decades, much of the experiment has been done on W boson. You must know about W and Z bosons that they mediate weak force. You know there are four fundamental forces in universe, gravitational force, electromagnetic force, strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force. This weak force is that weak nuclear force. But unlike the other three, weak force is not a push or pull force, but it is a force that transforms heavier particles into lighter ones. So W bosons are actually responsible for subatomic shifting of elementary particles. For instance, muons, they transform into W boson and neutrino. And W boson in turn transform into electron and emits neutrino again. So gradually you see the particles are getting heavier from muon to W boson to electron. So bosons in general are responsible for production of force or attainment of mass. But W boson is responsible for a kind of force, but that is not the kind of fundamental force that we know of or perceive as a kind of push or pull force. But it's a force that transforms particles successively into heavier ones. And this effectively is important for radioactivity phenomena, which happens in the sun, which is the ultimate source of energy for the entire solar system. Muons, as we have seen previously, is a kind of lepton and this is also of a special interest because recently experiment has been carried out with the name of Muon G2 experiment. Muon is a heavier cousin of electron and the theoretical value of the magnetic moment of muon as coming from the standard model is very close to 2. So in the Muon G2 experiment, muon is a fundamental particle, it's a kind of lepton, you understand, 
G here stands for the magnetic moment. And the value of this magnetic moment is very close to 2 and hence the name of the experiment, Muon G2 experiment. The theoretical calculation as per the standard model is 2.00233 and the number goes on till more decimals. But there was slight discrepancy from this theoretical value in the experimental result. And the error was in the 8th decimal. You see the accuracy with which these experiments are carried out. And this is too much to bear. Either the experimental result is incorrect or there got to be some particle which has got attached with this muon and we are not actually measuring the magnetic moment of just muon. But there is no such elementary particle that the standard model offers that explains this discrepancy. And hence it was expected that there must exist some undiscovered elementary particles. And the excitement in the scientific community was that we may be at the verge of discovering something that constitutes dark matter. Previously this experiment Muon G2 has been carried out and now the CDF experiment and previously in 2017 just like CDF experiment as we have been talking about Atlas experiment has been carried out and both shows discrepancy in the mass of W boson. Although it could be little early there could be some experimental error as well but the diligence with which these experiments are carried out there were approximately 400 scientists involved in this one particular experiment. The chances that there are experimental errors is less. Given the background that the standard model does not explain everything, there got to be some other better model, succeeding standard model that will explain everything including gravitation, including dark energy, dark matter, including the oscillation of neutrinos. That is why the experimental result of ATLAS, CDF and Muon G2 experiment has been telling us that we may be at verge of finding something new, something beyond the standard model. That would be sufficient for our examination perspective. More theoretical discussion will go beyond the demand of the exam. There's a news article on page number 4 concerning Mandrega. Mandrega has been in news a lot. You must also have been reading news regarding corruption in Mandrega in the state of Jharkhand. Taking this opportunity, let's have a comprehensive discussion on this important central scheme. National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme is a demand-driven social security measure that provides minimum of 100 days of unskilled work per household in a financial year. These information are important for the prelims examination. Who is eligible for the scheme? Anyone who is above 18 years of age and reside in rural areas. This scheme is applicable throughout the country except for those districts which has 100% urban population. And how urban and rural population are decided in India, you have to tell me that in the comment section. This scheme has been hailed by many including World Bank as the largest anti-poverty program. And the importance of this scheme is very high due to the fact that it is considered as backbone of the ruler economy whenever there is economic distress. According to the 2011 socio-economic caste census, around 40% of rural households are landless and depend on manual labor. This is the data that you have to keep up your sleeve to be used whenever there is a question on ruler distress, ruler employment generation in the mains examination. As we have discussed already, there were 7.6 crore families having active job cards under the scheme and 5.5 crore families were seeking work under the scheme. And this is a huge number. This scheme is catering to the employment generation of large number of people. On an average, the daily wage has gone up substantially. From the time this scheme was introduced, present average daily wage is rupees 209. And you must also remember a fact from NSSO report that areas with low consumption expenditure have higher MG Narek's demand as compared to areas with higher consumption expenditure. Lower consumption expenditure signifies economic financial distress, less demand. And when there is less demand, more financial stress, then Manrej's is an important source of income. And it also has been observed that women, SCs and STs as beneficiaries of Manrej's, their percentage has increased over the period of time. Presently, women are around 50% in the workforce under MG Narek's. So despite all its lacuna, it is indeed a very important source of employment generation, especially in the time of economic distress. There are certain very important characteristics of this scheme, which you have to remember for the mains exam. There is no concept of right to work under fundamental right in India. 
right to work is not recognized as fundamental right, although it's a very important part of directive principle of the state policy, but it is not justifiable right. However, Mahatma Gandhi National Ruler Employment Guarantee Scheme is right-based. You can go and ask for work, and if work is not given to you, then unemployment alliance will be given to you. So it is a right-based approach that has been adopted through MG Narrates. It is also demand-driven. Center give resources to the state government depending upon how much demand is there for the work in the state. There is also no problem of targeting unlike other schemes because this scheme is self-targeting. You seek for work. If you need work, you go and ask for work. That is self-targeting and hence this overcomes the problem of targeting. As we have talked about, there is unemployment allowance. If you go to seek work and work has not been provided to you within 15 days, then you are entitled for unemployment allowance. Unemployment allowance is not common in India, unlike Nordic nations. However, under this scheme, for the first time, this concept was introduced and it was institutionalized. If you don't get work, you'll get unemployment allowance. However, that will be lower than the wage that ordinarily a person will be getting under MG Narek. The scheme adopts bottom-up approach and it strengthens grassroots democratic institution of our country, which is Gram Sabha. Gram Sabha actually is entitled to decide on the nature of work to be adopted in the village. And it is also entitled to implement 50% of the work in terms of cost. And the rest 50% is taken up by the district administration or the state government. Also, tools of good governance, strengthening transparency and accountability has been embedded in the scheme. For example, there is mandatory provision of social audit. There is also a provision of ombudsman system because CAG does not audit MG Nareks and Mahatma Gandhi National Ruler Employment Guarantee Act also asks the state government to proactively disclose all the information on the web portal. And that's how the information we have got that 1.9 lakh people have got employment so far under Nareks. As we saw in the beginning, performance of the schemes taken for the vulnerable sections by the center and the state has been mentioned in the syllabus. So if you're doing any important scheme, you have to do the performance analysis of this scheme because that's the most likely thing to be asked in the mains exam. Let's do the same for National Ruler Employment Guarantee Scheme. How the scheme is doing? The scheme is doing fairly well despite its lacuna that we will also discuss. But first thing is there has been increased in ruler wages. As we have seen the present wage under the scheme with some disparity among the state is 209 rupees. And it has gone up substantially from the time it was institutioned. Although to a limited extent, the scheme has helped in achieving the concept of decent work by providing facilities like shade and also krishe facilities in certain Narega sites, for example, in Meghalaya, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. As we have seen a moment back that 5.5 crore households were given employment last year. On an average, 5 crore households have been given employment from 2008. Obviously, this will help in reducing the distressed migration. We have also discussed that the scheme is self-targeting. Narex is also seen as a risk mitigation mechanism. As per the annual report of Ministry of Ruler Development on Narega, it has been shown that when rainfall is scanty, in those years, there is higher overall participation in Narex. Although there has been claims and allegations that Manrega has diverted the manpower from agriculture, hurting agriculture, but Ministry of Rural Development in its annual report has put out that Manrega has actually helped agriculture. It has helped in various ways, for example, construction of agricultural assets like farm ponds, irrigation assets, and this has helped in the usage of barren lands for cultivation. This has also helped the small and marginal farmers in moving towards dual and multi-cropping. And this has also helped in making the water available in general for humans and livestock. Naregs has also helped in empowerment of weaker section and hence bringing social justice in society. This is a very, very important data that you have to remember that as per NSSO report, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes have accounted for 51% of manpower under Naregs. Women around 47% and this has increased to around 50% right now. But the mandated percentage of women participation was 33%. And the women participation has surpassed much higher than this. You also have to know, as per the directive given by Ministry of Ruler Development to the states, beneficiaries under Forest Right Acts are entitled for 150 days of employment as against 100 days of employment in general category. And certain states like Rajasthan has given employment of 200 days to communities like Shahriyas.
So this is a very important scheme for socio-economic justice and empowerment of weaker sections. The scheme has also helped in financial inclusion because the payment under the scheme is done directly into the bank accounts of the beneficiaries through direct benefit transfer. You can also highlight that certain human development indicators are supposed to be increased, although we do not have very strong concrete data on this. But since the income generation has increased, based on that, you can say that food security and nutritional security must have improved to a certain extent. And when the income of adults in the households increases, that inversely affects child labor and positively impacts children's schooling. Because we saw in the beginning in the definition that this provides only unskilled work. And that is one of the major criticism. We will see certain ways how to improve the design of MG Narics. First and foremost is to expand the definition of work. There are certain states who have taken proactive measures in this regard. For example, state of Tamil Nadu. They have been giving employment in semi-skilled areas under Manrig as well. So definition of work must be improved to include semi-skills work as well. For example, desilting of canals and water bodies. This is taken up in the state of Tamil Nadu. This should be taken as a template and improvement in the act should be done by the Central Ministry of Rural Development. What can also be done is to converge Manrakes with the skilling program of Government of India like Deen Dayal Upadhyay Grameen Kaushal Yojana. An involvement of SSGs can also be done either in skilling program or registration of workers etc. as was seen in Kudumba Shri in Kerala. When SSGs were involved, participation under Manrakes improved drastically. Manrakes is already using infrastructure of direct benefit transfer. So beneficiaries already have bank accounts and their mobile numbers are also registered. So the infrastructure of jam Trinity can be further utilized to increase the insurance coverage through the Manrega program and micro credit and micro insurance can also be given to the beneficiaries under Manregs. This is a very, very important solution for the improvement of the scheme. Gram Sabha, as we saw in the beginning, although has been made the central point in the implementation of the scheme, but the Gram Sabha is most of the time marginalized, sidelined, by the district administration or the state government. But in this regard, Meghalaya as a state has become a role model in giving immense amount of power to the Gram Sabha in implementation of the scheme. This can also be considered by the Ministry of Rural Development to improve the scheme. As we saw previously in the feature of the scheme that social audit is mandatory for the scheme. But most of the state has not institutionalized it and social audit does not happen regularly. But Andhra Pradesh and Telangana government have made special provision for the social audit beyond what has been mentioned in the legislation. And hence, this becomes another important recommendation for the improvement of the scheme. We saw previously that there is an ombudsman system within the scheme, but it is recommended for better financial integrity and propriety, CAG must be allowed to do the audit of Mandrakes. Presently, there is no provision of grievance redressal. It is mentioned in the act that you go for the work, you'll be given the work. If the work is not given within 15 days, you'll be given unemployment allowance. There is nowhere you can go for your grievance redressal except for the courts. And that is going to take time. So it is suggested that a grievance redressal mechanism should be made within the provision of the scheme. Presently, work of 100 days is mandated under the scheme. And it is suggested that because of the ruler distress, this can be increased further, maybe to 150 or 200 days, depending upon the resource with the state government. Writing a small case study in the mains examination can be very marks fetching, especially in 15 marker. I'm giving you a case study which you have to trim down within 50 words to make it usable for the 15 markers in the mains exam. See, Tamil Nadu has institutionalized Mandrakes with public works program. And the dual purpose of asset creation and livelihood security is ensured in this way. Ministry of Ruler Development of the State is collaborating with Department of Agriculture, Fisheries, Horticulture, etc. for this purpose. This covers most of the aspect of MG Narics. You can use this notes as a template for the answer writing and you keep adding it throughout the year up till you write the mains examination. Anything that you consider relevant to this topic. There is an article on page number 7, The Importance of Emigrants. According to the Ministry of External Affairs, there are around 13.4 million non-resident Indians worldwide. And these migrants have not only contributed to the growth of destination countries, but they also have benefited India in terms of higher remittance, enhancement of India's soft power, and greater integration of Indian economy with the global economy. 
In this regard, this article discusses the present status of remittances into India and also suggests some measures to enhance the inward remittance. See, remittance into India, as per the Migration and Development Brief Report of the World Bank, the latest we have is of November 2021. According to this report, India continues to be the largest remittance recipient country in the world. The inward remittance into India is around $37 billion. And India has been the largest remittance recipient country since 2008. You must also know that remittance into India accounts for roughly 2.9% of GDP. And you know what? This is higher than the FDI flow into India. And moreover, the inward remittance flow in India is more stable. It's not fluctuating like FPI. The top five remittance receiving country in the world are India, followed by China, Mexico, Philippines and Egypt. And the top five countries receiving remittance in terms of percentage of GDP are Tonga, Lebanon, Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan and El Salvador. Some of the steps you must have off the cuff as to what should be done to increase the remittances into India. One of the fundamental things that needs to be done is to promote labor mobility from India. A. By reducing the cost of recruitment of workers and B. By having better coordination with the countries where migration from India are higher, for instance, the West Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. The cost of sending remittance must be reduced. You see, the cost of sending remittance from one country to another include a fee charged by the sending agent, which the banks ultimately charge the sender. It also includes the currency conversion fee for delivery of local currency to the beneficiary in another country. So just like recently you have seen a revolution in online payment because of the lower UPI payment fee, the same can be contemplated and implemented for remittances. Substantial portion of remittances are actually unaccounted. The informal, undocumented migration must be reduced by greater coverage of registration. And labor mobility can only be increased if protection and safety of migrant workers can be ensured. There must be some accountability for recruiting agencies. The Indian foreign nation must be in touch and monitor the working of these recruiting agencies and finally the working condition of companies and corporations where Indian migrants are employed. Labor mobility can also be increased by enhancing the skill set of migrant workers. Government of India has taken some initiative in enhancing the skill set of migrant workers. Jog your memory and list down some of the initiatives in the comment section. Above all, to set all these balls rolling, there has to be an overarching policy and legislation. For this purpose, the Draft Immigration Bill 2021 must be passed expeditiously. Presently, the migrant workers face number of challenges such as higher recruitment charges, retention of passports, non-payment and underpayment of wages, poor living condition, discrimination and various other forms of ill-treatment. Hence, to address these problems, the government has proposed Draft Immigration Bill 2021 to replace the existing Immigration Act of 1983. The prime purpose of this draft bill is to provide a regulatory mechanism to govern overseas employment of Indian nationals and protect and promote the welfare of Indian immigrants. Some of the features of the bill include mandatory registration for all category of workers before departure to any country so as to ensure better protection, support and safeguard for them in case of vulnerabilities. There has been a body proposed called as Immigration Management Authority. This body will be an overarching authority to provide policy guidance. Now sit down tight. I'll ask you a question and you have to answer. I'll read out the question for you. I'll give you two seconds of time to think and you have to tell me whether the statement is true or false. Summon all your energy and attention and take this speed test with utmost enthusiasm. Collider detector at Fermilab experiment and Atlas experiment are related to neutrinos. The statement is incorrect, they are related to bosons. Standard model does not explain the theory of gravitation as described by general relativity. The statement is absolutely true. You know that under standard model, bosons provide force and boson corresponding to gravitation has not been discovered yet. So gravity is not considered as a force under standard model. According to the standard model, elementary particles in nature are quarks, leptons, bosons and fermions. There are three elementary particles, quarks, leptons and bosons. Fermions here have been added additional to what are considered as elementary particles. 
Muan G2 experiment recently in news is a groundbreaking experiment that has discovered a new particle that may be the constituent of dark matter. It has given us nothing so far. It just has created suspicion that something can be missing in the standard model and that missing thing can be something that constitutes dark matter. But we know nothing for sure till now. So to say that it has discovered something would be absolutely incorrect. Higgs boson gives rise to the phenomena of mass and energy and hence it is called as God particle. Higgs boson is a kind of boson that gives rise to the phenomena of mass, not energy. Weak force transforms heavier particle into lighter ones. The statement is correct and hence it gives rise to radioactivity. Remittances into India as a percentage of GDP is more than FDI. We have seen this. This is a correct statement. GDP. As a percentage of GDP, remittance is around 2.9%. FDI is around 2.5%. India gets highest amount of remittance from UAE. The statement is incorrect. India gets highest amount of remittance from US. That's around $68 billion. That is followed by UAE, $43 billion. Then Saudi Arabia, around $35 billion. And then Switzerland. Participation of women under Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme has been more than 50%. It's a fact, very important fact concerning female labor force participation in the rural region. The statement is correct, although it has been to five years low and that still stands at around 53%. Although present participation of women in MG Narega is at 5 years low, but it is still at around 53%. The question is, in which of the following case, one or other provision of law has not been struck down? Shreya single case, you know, Section 66A of IT Act was struck down. In Navtet Singh Johar case, you know, Section 377 concerning homosexuality was struck down. In Joseph Schein case, also called as adultery case, concerning section 497 of IPC was struck down. In MC Mehta case, no section was struck down. In MC Mehta case, article 21 was expanded in its scope and the right to live in pollution-free environment was declared as a fundamental right. Now you have question of the day for yesterday and question of the day for today. Please do what you always do and be upbeat about your coming prelims exam.